I'm here today with Team 11166 out of Lawrenceville Township, New Jersey, Big Red Robotics. You guys recently walked away with winning Lions Captain number one in the Upper Southern NJ League Tournament and also first place control award. So can you guys introduce yourself one by one? Anton. Hi guys, I'm Andrew. Hi, my name is Arisa. And without further ado, let's get right into it. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Discover how Kettering University students engineer their success with Kettering's amazing co-op employment programs where students earn great pay and gain valuable experience. Those accepted into Kettering University can apply for a robotic scholarship providing up to an additional $5,000 a year in tuition assistance. Head on over to kettering.edu slash first to learn more and apply. Support funds content creators when you sign up for a membership on YouTube Join. You'll get access to special perks like emotes, loyalty badges, and fund members will even get early access to our scheduled videos and more. 100% of this revenue will go back to our correspondents to help recognize their efforts. Click the join button in any YouTube video to pledge your support. Do you guys want to talk a little bit about your drivetrain? I, I can see here you guys have a pretty unique design with the motors being vertically mounted and inside the structure. So you want to go a little bit more in depth on how that works? Sure, yeah, of course. So, um, chassis consists of four Gobilda mechanism wheels right here. We also have three odometry pods that track our movements during autonomous. Um, and these are our mechanism wheels are driven by uh, 435 RPM Gobilda motors, which are two of them are mounted vertically and then two of them are mounted horizontally in the channel. Um, and those are powering the new Gobilda bevel gears, um, which then convert the power to our, to our wheels. Um, we also have these side plates. So we have the main side plate portion right here, as well as the front side plate portion here. And these just prevent pixels from entering our robot and getting stuck in our wheels. Awesome. So do you want to talk about the gear ratio really fast on your bevel gears? So our, our bevel gears are just one-to-one -one Gobilda bevel gears. Um, it's just the standard kind of bevel gear. Um, but these are the ones without the set screws. Um, so they're, they're the newer model. Um, and they're, they just have more contact on the teeth to maintain consistency. So. so how did you guys go about adding new things to your robot? Because I know this is like your third iteration so far, right? Yeah, so this is actually our uh, fourth iteration. Um, and we, we actually start with a larger chassis. So this chassis is 14 holes long. Uh, sorry, 13 holes long, and we started with a 14 hole long chassis. We also started with 312 RPM Gobilda motors um, and the old bevel gears from Gobilda, which did have the set screws. And we transitioned to the 435 just because we needed that extra speed um, just to traverse around the field um, really quickly. Um, and we, we also originated with um, our side plates from last year, which had a much higher ground clearance, which means that pixels got under our like wheels and got stuck in the robot. So that's why we have this full like protection of our wheels, and we really make sure that pixels do not get stuck in our robot. So I know you guys got your fourth iteration out decently fast. So for other teams looking to do a rebuild, what would you guys suggest? Like, what, what kind of steps did you guys take to get where you are right now? Um, do small iterations. So our four iterations, they were not that we did incremental steps, never taking too big of leaps. So our first iteration was just the claw. Second iteration, we were able to drop from the front of our robot. Third iteration, our claw was now able to twist. Fourth iteration, our claw is now able to extend. So these incremental upgrades are what allow us to um, not completely take apart our robot and have to rebuild it, just doing little things at a time. Awesome. So from the programming standpoint as well, so... Have you guys used odometry in the past? And if so, if you if this is your first time using it now, like how would you guys kind of approach the localization issue? So um, this is our first year using dead wheel odometries. We were thinking about it last year, but last year was kind of our revival year where um, none of the team members had previous experiences or were um, in the team uh, the previous year before that and so due to time constraints and not enough um, programmers we couldn't implement the dead wheel odometry um, this year we do have three dead wheel odometries which makes everything better um, the tuning took a lot of time but we made sure that the programmers came in at a different time from the engineers so that uh, we have the robot to our own when we were trying to tune the robot and uh, run the autonomous trials as much as we can. Awesome. So you talked a little bit before about your iterative design process and how you make small steps. You want to kind of point out a mechanism where that was like really in key? Yeah, so I would say our biggest change from uh, 
our 3.0 version to this, our 4.0 version, is our extending arm. So our extending arm allows us to do a whole bunch of things. So if I bring it up here, we can see I'm able to, this is our preset position for the first row of pixels, and I'm able to retract and extend to multiple positions. And this allows us to, even if there's pixels between us and the backdrop, we're still able to extend and get that reach. That also enables us to go much higher from the front of our robot, as well as out of the back of our robot, sorry, out of the back of our robot, we are able to go super high and place pixels just above the second set line. That's awesome. So do you want to talk a little bit actually about how your claw is powered? Because I can see a rack and pinion kind of going on there. So how did you guys, like what steps did you take to kind of come to that conclusion? Because there's also a lot, other, a lot of other options like rigging that teams could take. Yeah, so we, um, a lot of other teams chose to do slides with a two bar on them. We chose the alternative approach, which is a two bar with slides on it. And this allows us to get different types of positioning. So we are powering it with the uh, rack and pinion. And this is mostly because we, well, we saw a design, we really liked it. It allows us a lot of reliability. It does not break. We have not had it break once, as opposed to slides, which you have to restring retention. And at the same time, there's minimal slippage. Oh, that's awesome. So you guys basically got rid of the entire slides concept entirely. So this is two uh, low side U channels attached onto each other? Yes. Oh, so it's a pretty mechanical, like mechanically, you know, sync design. You have very little moving parts, I'd say. That is correct, yes. <laughs> All right, so you, you've had, had it, like, what type of advantages have you guys seen with it? Yeah, so here, what do you mind? So, um, I, as I said before, it allows us to score with um, pixels in front of our robot pushed against the backdrop, which we were not able to do before. We can place super high. And we can place, flipping over to back, um, we can place out of the back of our robot out of a really high height. So that's what our extension allows us to do. Oh, that's pretty sick. Yeah, so it probably, all right, cool. So do you want to go into a little bit about your wrist and kind of some issues and like challenges you kind of face like with designing it? Sure, yeah, of course. So um, when he's referring to wrist, he's referring to our like claw portion. Um, and this wrist is powered by a just standard go build a servo. Um, and we, so yeah, it's this, oh, it's, <laughs> you know, it's this portion right here. Um, so we just have a uh, sprocket right here and here, and that's just connected by a chain link. Um, and we, we did have a, uh, a couple of problems just with this servo burning out, and that's why we kind of increased this um, gear ratio just to kind of, like, help with us and help us, like, achieve that, like, the speed and torque needs that we need. Um, and then I guess I'll segue into the claw. Um, so our claw, we also had some burnout issues with our servos. Um, so we moved our mechanism away from using the servo to close, and instead we're using springs. So as you'll see, we have a spring here and a spring here. And what this allows us to do is our servo opens the claw with a pin, and it pulls, so this pin like pulls open our claw, and then the pin releases, and then that allows our spring to actually hold the pixel, which means that our claw is not straining when we hold these pixels. It allows us to hold it with much more force than most other teams um, who use the servo to power that, and it still works very, very accurately. Um, for our claw, we started with just a single claw, um, and then we evolved into this two kind of claw setup. Um, and we use these rubber kind of like cylindrical pieces to hold the pixels very, very well. Um, and it can hold it in multiple different orientations just based on like the, we designed this to like fit the shape of the pixel. Um, and then the last thing that we added was this servo right here. So this actually started as a standard go build a servo. Um, and we upgraded the servo um, because it has more torque and it's a lot more like, um, it has like a lot more uh, better like precision. Um, so we use this to rotate our, here, can you just show them? So we use this to rotate our claw like into this position, for example. Um, and it just gives us a lot more like um, positions that we can go to as well as um, having the claw drop from the top so that the pixels fall and they are much more consistent this way. So. That's cool, awesome. So from a programming standpoint as well, how did it kind of look like to you know, program something with this many movements into it and like kind of like how you went into the tele-op phase, some kind of driver enhancements that you added as well? 
Um, it was a lot of fun coding Tally Up, especially because, well, most of the robots or the robot we used last year was largely an autonomous because we had to compensate the inaccuracy, um, not using dead wheel odometry. So a lot of it was trying to use the sensor, um, get the right value to detect when uh, we're right, right in front of the pole or if we're, uh, you know, shifted a little bit to the right, then go to the left and all of that stuff. This year, um, we used more time on Tally Up, especially because there's so many servos and motors that we have to move um, at once without delay so that no arms dragging or um, no you know claw is kind of t entangled in all of the other components um, something that was interesting for me was that the a servo and the motor has like two different classes or two different structures of the program uh, so servo turns or starts moving to the desired position right when we set the target position. But the motor, we have to um, put, like, set the power manually in order for it to start moving. So uh, since we used, like, an arm power um, code that, like, just manages all of the arm lifting mechanism separate from moving around the servos, um, we had a lot of issues with um, the claws just, you know, rotating first and then the arm kind of drags it up or the other way around where the arm is still trying to go up but the claw doesn't move until it finishes the movement and um, it gets tangled in one of the, like, the other way around. So, um, yeah, it was a lot of using delays, not using delays, uh, arranging the order of which motor to move and then which servo to move. Wow, that's awesome. Thank you so much for the detailed description. Also, I see your camera kind of placed here. It's in a pretty unique position. How did that kind of work for you guys and what's its function? Um, so especially because we used dead wheel odometries this year, we the primary use for our camera was to detect the team prop and we figured out that if we just capture the three lines, the spike marks at once, then it does the job. And and so this was kind of the best place, especially because it's such a big robot. In order to fit into the um, place where we have to place the robot, we kind of had needed the camera to be at the center of the robot. Um, the Putting it on the arm is because uh, to get we put the camera on the arm to get enough height so that um, we actually do picture the three lines from like a distanced view and um, also potentially so that we could detect the April, April tags in order to um, kind of enhance our accuracy on the backdrop scoring. Wow, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Also, I wanted to kind of go into a little bit about how this specific uh, belt mechanism worked for you guys. Can you guys kind of talk about the teeth ratio that you had on this and kind of how you approach this one as well? Because it's definitely very unique from what other teams are doing. Sure, yeah. So um, our belt mechanism at least consists of, so we have a Go Build a 312 RPM motor under here. And then, no, can we show the, and then we have these two Go Build a, um, the two go build a new bevel gears as well. Um, so basically the, the motor spins these bevel gears and then this connects to the gears up here which spin our arm. So this is a 48 um, go build a timing pulley as well as we have a tensioner right here. Um, and these are both the 16 tooth timing pulleys. Um, so we gear these up a lot. Um, and the reasoning is that our arm is very, very heavy. Um, so we need this extra gearing to make sure that we can hold our arm in its extended position um, just because it requires a lot of like battery and a lot of torque to do that. Um, so that's why we've geared it up this much. And honestly, our arm still is very quick. So we haven't seen any drawbacks of gearing it up to this type of a gear ratio. So yeah. Oh, wow. Thank you so much. Awesome. Next off, we kind of want to talk a little bit about the drone launcher. So you want to go into a little bit about like how your drone launcher works and, you know, a little bit about that. Yeah. So our drone launcher is very simple. Um, here, I'm going up. So we have two U channels here and it's powered by two servos. One servo to lift this from down to up and then another servo to release this rubber band, which just shoots the drone out. And because we have this degree of freedom here, we can tune our drone launcher on the bot. So it's super easy to, if we see it's flying too far or not far enough, we can just adjust some code and make that change. That's awesome. You wanna just show like the motion of it kind of popping up again? Yeah. Um, for the uh, viewers to see. 
So here's it down, and then awesome. it up. Wow, that's pretty cool. So it consistently gets first to second set line for you guys? Yes. Oh, that's yeah, awesome. In our, in, our tournament we had, in our tournament, we had pretty much all first and second um, set lines. Other than we, we had a, a few times where our drone did not launch, but other than that, we pretty much got in, in the first and second zones. Oh, wow, that's awesome you guys were able to get that working. Pretty cool. Oh, so you guys want to, really quick, I see this kind of thing over here. It's really interesting to me. What, what, what is that? What do the uh, kind of wheels have in the back? What's the function? Yeah, so um, the, these green wheels just act as stabilizers. Um, and the reasoning is that when we extend our arm to our fully back position, um, so as Anton will show, um, but when we extend our, our arm to the fully back position, um, we have a lot of weight back here, which means that we can tip very easily. So that's why we kind of added these wheels, just to make sure that we don't tip and fall over in competition. Um, so that's the main purpose of them. We have um, tried some different wheels, for example, Omni wheels and like different kind of um, like positions for the wheel. Um, but we found that these work very well for us and we have not tipped over in competitions. So they work very well. Oh, awesome. Do you guys also want to talk a little about the uh, CAD aspect beyond your robot, if you guys use a little bit of that? or uh... Sure, yeah. So we use, um, we use Fusion 360 to um, CAD pretty much all of the custom parts. And then we, um, so we CADed our claw, for example. So all of these parts were CADed in Fusion, and then we water jet um, cut these parts in-house. We also CADed our side plates. Um, so this was all catted as well as our battery holder, which it's kind of hard to see, but we 3D printed this battery holder. Um, we also have these back plates as well that were all catted. Um, and then the other thing that we have is these hooks. So these like positive stops just allow us to like turn our motors off so that we're not like constantly just using battery. So this holds our arm in that like front position um, and these were all catted in Fusion 360 as well. Wow, awesome. So do you want to talk very fast just about how your rigging works and kind of going into like, because I, I, you guys hang off your bar, correct? Or yeah, kind yeah. of expand on that a little bit? Um, yeah, sure. So here if you can. Yeah, so our hang mechanism going up. So we have these two hooks right here. They are stocko builder that we then custom cut down. So we just drive up to the beam, they're at the right height, where we kind of snap them in here, and then we can hit a button and basically retract this arm down at full power, and that's how we get our hank. Wow, awesome. Yeah, thank you so much for this interview. I, I was here with 1166 Big Rider Bikes, and they had a very successful season, and it's awesome having them there with us today. Thank you. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Discover how Kettering University students engineered their success with Kettering's amazing co-op employment programs where students earn great pay and gain valuable experience. Those accepted into Kettering University can apply for a robotic scholarship providing up to an additional $5,000 a year in tuition assistance. Head on over to kettering.edu slash first to learn more and apply. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to stay up to date on our new videos. Keep the conversation going and provide your input to our content. Most live shows can be found on the First Updates Now YouTube channel, live competitions at twitch.tv slash firstupdatesnow, and join our Discord at discord.gg slash firstupdatesnow. Check our other social offerings on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter.